Good morning, everyone. Um, Jen, is it okay to get started? I think so, Neil, thanks. Okay, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Neil Romanowski, the Dean of Libraries, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our fall semester installment of the Graduate Research Series. Uh, this series is held each semester to highlight graduate research um, and the and hear more about the obstacles and opportunities that students encounter during the research process. Uh, the presenters in the series um, are selected by the Graduate Research Committee, which is composed of librarians and staff from the university libraries and members of Graduate Student Senate. So today I'm very pleased to welcome James J. Fisher, a third year doctoral student in history in the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, who will be speaking about his research examining the impact of popular culture and politics in a presentation titled Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara, The Politics of Remembrance and Memorialization in Africa. Uh, James holds a Bachelor of Arts in History and Black World Studies from Miami University and a Master of Arts from Ohio University in History. His previously written theses uh, for his bachelor's and master's the um, degrees have both focused on the intersection of intellectual thought between Patrice Lumumba, the 1960 Prime Minister of the Republic of Congo, and Thomas Sankara, the uh, 1983 to 1987 President of Burkina Faso. So um, it is, again, my, my pleasure uh, to welcome James this morning, and uh, I will now turn it over to him. Welcome, James. Thank you, Dean uh, Romanowski. Uh, let me share my screen here. All right, so today, uh, as Dean Romanowski mentioned, I am talking about uh, the memorialization of Patrice Lumumba and Thomas Sankara in African popular culture and the political importance of this. Uh, so first, what is memorialization? It is the deliberate creation of something. Uh, this can be a painting, a street name, a building of things in memory of someone or something, often a political figure. The figures that I'll be talking about today are Patrice Lumumba, who is the first prime minister of the Democratic Republic of Congo from June 24th, 1960 to September 14th, 1960. And then the former president of Burkina Faso, uh, Thomas Sankara, who was president from 1983 to 1987. The two figures occupied uh, an important space in political transitions in post-colonial Africa, namely the colonial to post-colonial period uh, with Patrice Lumumba and the entry of the military into politics with Sankara. They're both indicative of these transitions in that uh, Lumumba was uh, ousted from power shortly after independence by Mobutu Sese Seko, as other several other uh, independence leaders were, such as Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana in 1966, as well as the disappointment that came with his fall in that uh, the dreams of independence were dashed uh, after his assassination and then the takeover by Mobutu uh, in a dictatorship. Likewise, Sankara is indicative of the entry of the military into politics because he was a revolutionary figure, as many were at the time. Uh, for example, Jerry, the, the late Jerry Rawlings of Ghana uh, or Yoweri Museveni of Uganda. Uh, he also had a lot of popular support when he came to power. He did not rise via a military coup like Mobutu, but rather through a popular revolution that appointed him uh, the president of the country. And likewise, the post-regime violence that followed Sankara's assassination, um, much like with Lumumba's assassination, uh, many of his followers were tracked down and uh, killed or they were exiled from the country. So there's this role of violence in both contexts. So before I move on, I wanna give just a brief uh, bit of information about the two so you have a better idea as we begin to talk about the memorializations. Uh, Lumumba, when he came to power, was a pan uh, as the head of a pan-ethnic political party in the DRC. Um, he had a lot of popular support, um, both internationally and uh, nationally. However, he quickly uh, began uh, with a lot of leftist rhetoric and even sought support from the Soviet Union, uh, particularly to fight the uh, two regions of the DRC which had seceded, uh, South Kasai and Katanga. 
um, after these, um, you know, pro-leftist statements, uh, the U.S. and other Western powers turned against him, and they supported uh, the coup by Mobutu and others, uh, as well as his capture and transportation to Katanga, where the, the leader of the region, Moise Shambe, uh, had him executed. Uh, likewise, with Sankara, he was a leftist, um, and he was very popular when he came to power. Uh, however, with Sankara, he was not as popular internationally. For example, he didn't have very many allies when he first came to power, excluding uh, Rawlings in Ghana, who was his both his personal friend and a close ally. Uh, but other leaders in the region, like uh, Ofoboni in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, were not much uh, of a fan, mostly due to his revolutionary rhetoric and the critiques that he offered of other longtime leaders uh, like Ofoboni. Uh, when he was assassinated in 1987, uh, it was by his deputy and close friend, Blaise Compoire, who would then go on to be a uh, dictator in Burkina Faso until he was overthrown in 2014, uh, which I'll talk about a bit here soon. Uh, next, I'm going to show several examples of memorialization. Uh, the first two will be uh, both visual and oral. There will be a song playing over the painting that is uh, portrayed, and after I've left the song play for a short time, I'll explain it. Uh, the third example will be a music video. Uh, the fourth will be another song with images, and then the final will be a interview with uh, Burkinabe musician uh, Sam Skloja. <laughs> Okay, so hopefully everyone heard the music. Um, so the first question we need to ask about these memorializations is what is the artist's role in African politics? Uh, these two examples of memorialization that I show here uh, that you heard and that you can see um, are two different examples of these roles. The first, the song, is the Independence Cha Cha by L'African Jazz, a popular rumba band in the Congo at the time. Uh, of Lumumba's uh, time in power. Uh, the band offered political support, not just to Lumumba, but to many of the other independence leaders uh, in the region. Uh, for example, uh, Lumumba would drive around the capital, uh, Kinshasa, with the musicians in his car, kind of to seek uh, both political support and to make himself more popular in, that, uh, in the capital. The song talks about the excitement of independence. Um, and as you can tell from the, the, the music, it's very happy, it's filled with joy at the promises that liberation brings. The other example that we can see here, the painting by Shibumba Mutulu, who is a Congolese historian and artist uh, in the 1970s and 80s, shows the independence of what would become Zaire uh, on June 30th, 1960. You can see from the painting, uh, which is a retrospective, as Shibumba painted this uh, in the uh, 70s, Lumumba has his hand raised. He's shown, uh, you know, very stern, but leading his people to independence. You can see the crowd, everybody's smiling. There are birds flying in the background. The flag is waving. It's a very joyous scene. But in the background, you can also see the King of Belgium, uh, the guy there in the uniform. He appears as a more sinister figure behind Lumumba, uh, you know, with an odd smile, with his head tilted down, his hands are hidden behind his hat, holding a sword. And I think that this is Matulu kind of pointing to the role that Belgium would play in Lumumba's fall. Uh, for example, they supported the breakaway region of Katanga, mostly due to the mineral resources and the Belgian companies that operated in the region. And they played a, a role in his execution. Uh, for example, a Belgian police officer uh, oversaw his execution and two Belgian police officers helped dispose of Lumumba's body. Uh, the song by L'African Jazz shows the artist's role in aiding politics at the time that they are, um, you know, alive and singing and popular. 
Uh, Matulu's, on the other hand, shows more of a retrospective role, bringing the memory back to life and being able to talk about the historical importance of the figure that they're memorializing. Uh, the next slide will also play a song and over a painting, and I'll let it play for uh, a moment. So that song is by the Belgian Congolese rapper Badi, uh, and the song is titled Letra Ama Femme, Letter to My Wife. Uh, what Badi did is he took the letter that Lumumba uh, wrote just prior to his death, uh, that he wrote to his wife, and he turns it into a song. Uh, and it's a work of memorialization, not just in the fact that he's taking Lumumba's words and turning it into a song, but also in the way that uh, Badi's dressed in the music video itself. He wears a similar style suit that Lumumba often wore. He wears the leopard skin cap that Lumumba was known for wearing, as well as the same kind of glasses, and he even cuts his facial hair to look more like Lumumba's. Um, in the letter that Lumumba wrote, he talks about his hopes for an independent Congo, uh, that it will remain united after his death, and that even though he's uh, being sentenced to execution, his struggle will not die with him. Matulu's painting that we can see here, the historic death of Lumumba and Polo and Okito, shows not just Lumumba's death, but those of his two uh, ministers who were executed alongside him, Polo and Okito, in a Christ-like way, uh, which is very common for portrayals of Lumumba. He's often, whether in song or painting or in uh, the works of Sylvain Bimba, the Congolese playwright, he's very often portrayed in a Christ-like manner. You can see the crosses in the background, as well as the wound on Lumumba's side. So once again, this idea of his dreams or his dreams for an independent Congo not dying with him uh, can be seen not just in the song, but then also in the painting itself. Likewise, this points to this idea of martyrdom in the death of Lumumba and then later with Sankara. Martyrdom is typically associated with religious figures, but with Lumumba and Sankara, I think that you can categorize their deaths as martyrdoms because they died for their political ideas. Uh, and in the ways in which they have been portrayed after their deaths, I think that this idea of martyrdom plays out. Next, we have a video from the Cote d'Ivoirian group KMG. It starts with a speech by Sankara, uh, part of a speech by Sankara, which I'll let play and then the video itself. Le néocolonialisme, le racisme, le fantochisme, droit, dignité, pouvoir, la patrie ou la mort, la patrie ou la mort, mais c'est camarade. So I'll discuss the, the lyrics here in a moment. I recognize that not everybody uh, speaks French. Uh, but I want to talk about the imagery in the video before that. So the song itself is called La Patrie ou la Mort, uh, Homeland or Death, which is the phrase that Sankara used as well as the national motto of Burkina Faso at the time. Uh, 
at the beginning of the song, you see the speech that Sankara is giving in which he's saying things like, you know, imperialism down with it, uh, racism down with it, fascism down with it. And then it goes into his motto of La Patria de Mort, Nouveau Van Cran. And then KMG, which uh, is a group from Cote d'Ivoire, they're taking this and reappropriating this idea of homeland or death to not just talk about Sankara's struggle, but then to connect it to the 2014 popular revolution in Burkina Faso that overthrew, or that overthrew Blaise Compaoré, uh, the longtime dictator, and Sankara's murderer. So the images that are playing in the background of the song itself, uh, for example, here, are of the 2014 revolution. So it's not just this idea of the past memorializations, but also a more contemporary memorialization of the protesters themselves. Moving on to some of the lyrics, uh, you have the artist saying things like, I heard the voices of, or I heard the voice of Sankara, the struggle of Lumumba, the martyrs won't die. Once again, this idea that Sankara and Lumumba are martyrs and that their struggle, even though they have physically died, their struggle has not died with them. And this also connects to a quote of Sankara's in which he says something uh, similar along those lines of, even though I may die, my ideas, my revolution will not. Likewise, the artists say, dying while protecting the green, yellow, red, you have to kill me first before destroying my country. Once again, this idea of homeland or death, referring to the Burkinabe flag there. Uh, how long it took to build the country in memory of our martyrs, I will die quite frankly for the respect of our motto. Once again, La Patria L'Amour, but then also referring again to not just Sankara and Lumumba as martyrs, but also those who died in the 2014 revolution, those who support revolution more uh, globally, those are also martyrs. And then the country or death, our weapon is our motto, the country or death fighting to set you free. And I think that this line here talking about freedom is significant because while Lumumba's um, time and power can, can more explicitly be tied to freedom and that he led Congo to independence, it's also significant because Sankara too, in a way, led his country to independence. While Burkina Faso had been independent since the uh, 60s from the French, they had mostly been under various uh, dictators or strongmen until a more democratic revolution took place that brought Sankara to power. So in a way, he also set the country free in many ways. Underground system is their lives. One African leader day to day. All African people them like the man. Him in the president Sankara. That's Sankara story you carry. All African people them like the man. This in the president Sankara. So that song is by Fela Kuti, uh, who's one of the most famous musicians to come out of West Africa, specifically Nigeria. And the song is called Underground System, which refers to this idea of an underground system of African politics, uh, what controls everything below the surface, uh, which Kuti connects to neocolonialism. Uh, what's significant about it is that uh, Fela Kuti was actually writing this prior to Sankara's death. He was friends with Sankara. Um, at one point, Kuti was jailed by the Nigerian government and Sankara helped get him released. Uh, they had planned a tour of uh, Pan-African tour together uh, to promote Pan-Africanism and revolution. Uh, and when Kuti heard of Sankara's death, he instead switched the song to one of memoriam to instead talk about Sankara and his greatness as he says, you know, everyone in Africa likes the man. Uh, but he also connects Sankara's death very explicitly to neocolonialism and to, by extension, Europeans. Uh, this is important because while Lumumba, we, we know, was murdered at the hands of not just uh, local Katanganese uh, government, but then also Belgians and the Americans were also involved in his assassination. With Sankara, it's been a bit unclear as the French government has never opened their archives, but it's very likely that the French were involved in some capacity. Uh, once again, this idea of neocolonialism, that colonialism did not necessarily end when the Europeans left, but they've managed to stay involved, uh, mostly through things like corruption and uh, counter-revolutionary uh, people like Blaise Compaoré. 
And this idea of bringing the the ghosts of the past, bringing Lumumba and Sankara into the present in African politics is important, not just because taking their, uh, reappropriating their images can lend political legitimacy. For example, in the uh, Congo with uh, Joseph Kabila, the former president of the Congo, he would uh, go lay wreaths at statues of Lumumba. He would rename streets after him. Uh, or in contemporary Burkina Faso, where politicians will often cite Sankara, whether or not they actually represent his ideals. Um, these ghosts of the past can be used to gain political legitimacy, but they also are important in many of the political movements, uh, the democratic political movements active on the continent. For example, uh, in the 2014 revolution, many people in Burkina Faso, many people were carrying signs with Sankara's image on it, wearing t-shirts, uh, citing him in speeches um, or in chants. Uh, he was a central figure in this revolution, even if he was no longer alive. Likewise, uh, in Senegal, the group Yenamar uh, often cite Sankara as this important political figure to them, this inspiration. So this, the, these ghosts of the past in African politics continue to play an important role, even though they have uh, been deceased for quite some time. And the final example of memorialization is this interview. Shadow play for a moment. Sankara, Sankara, mon président. Sankara du Burkina. Il est venu en nos mains têtes pour bâtir une Afrique du Sankara, Sankara, Sankara. Sam Skaleja keeps the president's memory alive through music. I sing about Sankara because Sankara is, is my Bible, is my Quran, is uh, is my Jesus, is my Muhammad. That's why I sing about him because he's the one I know, and he's the one that taught us uh, some values. So to me, Sankara is the light in the darkness. So what we can see here is that, that this musician, uh, Sam Skleja, is, is talking about Sankara in a very, you know, almost religious way, uh, similar to how Lumumba is often portrayed as Christ, you know, Sankara, uh, Sam Skleja saying, you know, oh, he's, he's my Jesus, he's my Muhammad, he's my Bible, he's my Quran. Talking about the importance of Sankara's message, not just to him, but to you know the youth more broadly. Uh, and it's significant that Leja was active in the 2014 revolution. He was one of the musicians who helped uh, lead alongside the rapper Smake. And you know, as he's talking about Sankara, it's important to note that in Burkina Faso today, this uh, you know Sankara is still. An extremely popular figure. Uh, they just finished building a very large statue of him in uh, Ouagadougou, the capital. Um, and you still see, once again, a protest, political rallies, anything like that, his image crops up. And other scholars, such as uh, Alexander Reza, have pointed out the fact that whenever there are protests, um, not just in Burkina, but elsewhere on the continent, there are often images of Sankara, you know, somewhere. Um, likewise, uh, this goes back to the previous slide with the images of Lumumba and Sankara. Uh, even the way that they dressed has become iconic in a way. The hat that Lumumba wears here with the leopard skin uh, became associated with him for, for quite some time. And for example, when Badi, the rapper, whenever he appropriates Lumumba's image, he quite often wears this leopard skin cap. Uh, similar uh, with Sankara, the red beret that he wears has become you know, kind of iconic in terms of revolutionaries around the continent. You can look at uh, contemporary figures like Bobi Wine in Uganda, who's fighting for democracy, um, you know, or Julius Malema in South Africa, the economic freedom fighters, both wear these red caps. Um, in the case of Malema, it's very explicitly praising Sankara. Uh, in fact, his political party, when they run for office, they have to take a Sankara oath. Um, you know, once again, talking about him as this almost religious or uh, martyred figure. So what is the contribution of this research? What, what does it matter? Uh, well, first, the sources that I use in my research are central to understanding African history, um, but little attention has been paid to them. While historians tend to work in archives with 
you know, paper documents, written things. Uh, sources like music, film, uh, paintings even are largely ignored. Uh, for example, Matulu's paintings, uh, outside of uh, one work by Johannes Fabian, a uh, anthropologist, historians have largely ignored the way that Matulu chose to tell Congolese history. Likewise, music videos and music itself are largely ignored by historians in terms of how both they tell the past and how they uh, show the present. So, for example, in a study of the 2014 revolution, you can look at the way the musicians talked about the revolution, talked about the figures present in it. Um, but most historians tend to work instead with documents. Likewise, uh, when we discuss memorialization, we tend to discuss physical memorials, uh, statues, things that we can see or touch instead of music. But in uh, much of Africa, particularly West Africa and the Senegambia, where, where my dissertation research uh, is focused, oral history is instead more important than written documents quite often. Uh, and this music is a form of oral history. You can hear what people thought, uh, for example, with L'African Jazz, what people thought of Lumumba. Likewise, you can hear what people now think of these uh, past figures, Lumumba and Sankara. This also lends uh, credence to Matulu's critiques of history. Uh, the painter called himself a historian, uh, and he you know, explicitly said he was painting the history of the Congo uh, in a way that was different than most people had portrayed Congolese history up to that point. And he specifically critiques in interviews, he specifically critiques the uh, Western way of telling history of the Congo, uh, mostly focused on you know, the political leaders, Mobutu, rather than focusing on the people themselves or figures like Lumumba, who even though he died early on, still had a residual effect after his death. For example, some of his followers uh, fought a civil war for quite some time in the east of the country, uh, particularly Pierre Mulele, who was a minister in his government, continued the fight uh, in what was called the Simba Rebellion. Likewise, Raoul Peck, a Haitian filmmaker who's made two different films about Lumumba, critiques history by saying that there are these blank spots in the archive. Uh, how can we seek to tell history if there are these spots that we don't have anything for? And he specifically cites the Independence Day speech that Lumumba gave, where we do not have a uh, visual recording of it, but we have an audio recording. And this, I think, ties in very well with a lot of the literature that's coming out now. For example, Marissa Fuentes' uh, Dispossessed Lives, which talks about how the archive is a legacy of colonialism, and it was mostly curated by the colonizers. How can we necessarily trust the archive at all times if there are these gaps that are possibly purposeful? Likewise, an examination of these sources tells us what the people's expectations are, not just what they thought, but what they expect and hope for in politics, whether past or contemporary. If people are in a protest citing Sankara as their main political figure, and that tells us something about what they expect from their politicians. They expect them not to be corrupt. They expect them uh, to ensure that power is handed over to the people, not to a small group of politicians or military leaders. The work likewise draws attention to the two these two transitions in African history and how important Lumumba and Sankara were to those transitions. And then finally, there's a lack of other research on African memorialization. Uh, very few scholars have looked at memorialization um, or how it has been portrayed through popular culture. There are some scholars like uh, Berber Bevernage, who's a uh, Dutch scholar, who has looked at uh, memory and African history, mostly through the role of violence, but he does not seek to examine the actual memorializations of figures like Lumumba and Sankara. And finally, since this is sponsored by the, the Ohio University Libraries, I wanted to talk a bit about the library resources I use in my research. Um, I began this research during my bachelor's at uh, Miami University, but I've continued it since I've come to Ohio University. Uh, I conducted archival research at Indiana University Libraries, where they have some fantastic archives focused on African history, uh, particularly their music archive. I also use multimedia resources, as you saw and heard, uh, found both online and via the library. And of course, I used Ohio University and Ohio Link catalogs, particularly for my secondary sources. 
uh, in ILL for certain materials that were difficult to find, like uh, some of the primary sources. Uh, for example, Lumumba's speeches, if I wanted to buy them, uh, it would cost between $300 and $1,000, depending on where I wanted to, to purchase them, because Lumumba's speeches are out of print. You can, you can only buy the original copies uh, published in, I think, 1961. And then finally, the subject librarian, Araba Dawson Ando, was instrumental to my research when I first came to OU. Um, she helped me when I met with her, narrow down my research a little bit in terms of what sources I'd look at, uh, as well as help the library and myself procure certain hard to find materials like the French language biography of Thomas Sankara, uh, as well as other materials that uh, were not present at OU or in OhioLink. Thank you to The Ohio University Libraries and to Dean uh, Romanowski for giving me the opportunity to present my research. Uh, I now have time for questions. Thank you so much. So, yes, we're going to open it up now to audience questions. And OK, the chat is going. So um, if you have questions for James, you can either raise your hand um, and unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can type it into the chat and I will help moderate that. So um, we, the first question is, have you been to the Congo or Burkina and how did you get interested in this topic? I didn't realize I was muted. Um, unfortunately, I've not been to Burkina or the Congo. Um, when I was conducting this research, it was oh, about five years ago. Um, so it was around the time of the uh, 2014 revolution or shortly thereafter, um, and I didn't have the resources to go similar to, to going to the Congo. Um, I got interested in the topic through the music of Didier Awadi, uh, who is a Senegalese hip hop artist. Uh, he did an album called President d'Afrique, Presidents of Africa. Uh, and in this, he memorialized Sankara a lot, uh, as well as Lumumba. And I was curious as to why exactly he was talking about these these political figures. Uh, I was familiar with Lumumba, but Sankara I was I, I had not really heard of at the time. So I began listening to more music and reading about uh, Lumumba and Sankara, um, which was partially helped by the Ohio University Press who published the first English language biography of Sankara because at that time I, I wasn't uh, fully up on my French. Um, but through listening to his music, I, I got interested in the broader topic of memorialization in uh, African popular culture and politics. Thanks, James. We have, um, we have another question. Um, how would you suggest libraries and librarians best support historians' use of popular culture objects for research? That's a good question. Um, I would say one of the most important things would be by procuring music. Um, some of the music that I use, I was not able to find on something like YouTube, and instead I had to go actually purchase the CDs myself. Um, there's a great website called Disc, Disc Augs, which has a lot of rare or international music that's difficult to find elsewhere. Um, but some of the music uh, cannot be found online or through something like that. You actually have to physically go to, to West Africa or wherever and purchase the music. Um, so I would say that's, that's definitely one way is by purchasing the physical albums for historians. Great, thank you so much, James. Do we have any other questions? I think that's all the questions we have today, James. Oh, sorry. Nope. One just came in. What is your next area of research? Uh, so my dissertation research uh, that I'm working on now focuses <coughs> on the intersection between popular culture uh, and activism in West Africa, specifically the Senegambia. So that's Senegal, the Gambia, Mali, uh, and some of the other countries there. Um, and I look at the way that musicians in particular have used political rhetoric to bring about some sort of political change. Uh, so for example, the 2012 movement uh, Yenamar in Senegal that I mentioned before, how instrumental they've been in contemporary Senegalese politics. Um, they're mostly led by 
hip hop artists like Simon Kuka or the group Kergi. Um, so looking at that intersection is what my dissertation research focuses on. Thank you. Erba, did you have your hand up? Did you want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, James, did you, uh, what uh, what kinds of, uh, or what types of um, open access resources did you find? Because there are lots of uh, such materials like posters and all those, and a lot of ephemeral online. Did you consult any of those? Yeah, I found some of uh, some images, um, some political posters um, that I ended up using in the the actual uh, project itself and on the presentation. Um, I found some political posters from uh, I think Germany, from I assume the Burkinabe diaspora uh, of Sankara, with some quotes uh, beneath him. Likewise, some of uh, the contemporary political parties in Burkina uh, running uh, posters of theirs. I, I found as well. Okay, and the Heskovic Library at uh, Northwestern has a, a digital poster collection that has a lot with, uh, I think, uh, Patrice Lumumba. Okay. Yeah. That down. And then also the Michigan State um, African Online Digital Library also has lots of materials that ephemeral that you can use for such research. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, we have another question. Uh, in what ways does memorialization of leaders make it easier or harder for new and emerging leaders to carve their own leadership philosophies? I think in some ways it can make things a bit difficult in terms of, especially if you're coming from the, for example, like if you're a young Congolese um, politician and you're trying to kind of live up to this image, perhaps. Um, I could see that being a difficulty. Uh, same thing in Burkina Faso, because who can live up to this ideal of Sankara? Um, but I think in some ways, being able to tap into those images and those uh, memories can help your career. For example, in Uganda with Bobby Wine, um, there's the slight sidetrack, but there's a, a study that was done, I forget the author, but he looked at Sankara uh, in the context of revolutionaries in the 80s, uh, comparing him to Yoweri Museveni, who is still in power in Uganda, and um, Jerry Rawlings in Ghana. And I think that when you have Bobby Wine, he's not citing, you know, necessarily revolutionaries like Museveni, because Museveni is no longer a revolutionary. He's been in power for, you know, like 40 years. Uh, and instead, he's citing someone like Sankara. He's using that image, that that red beret, that revolutionary attitude. You know, combining as well the fact that Bobby Wine is a musician. He's using music uh, in these images in order to uh, further his political career. So I think that it can both help and hinder. I suppose it depends on how memorialization is being used. Um, as I mentioned, it can lend political legitimacy, as it did for Joseph Kabila in the Congo. Um, but it can also hinder you if you're trying to live up to this memory. Are there any other questions? Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> All right, I think we have someone with their hand up. George, did you have a question? Yes. Yeah, James, um, thank you very much for such an insightful presentation. Um, I want to ask a question that's more personally related to you. As a, as a foreign student working with oral tradition in, in, in Burkina Faso, um, I know there are issues at times with working with oral tradition, especially how this started in and the be and so I want to know what were some of the challenges that you faced and how you were able to interpret the that you had. Let me make sure I got the question because you, you were cutting in and out a little bit there. Um, how much challenges oh. did I face in interpreting the oral sources? Exactly. All right, thank you. 
Um, well, I mean, I, I was lucky. Well, let me not say lucky. It's a complicated answer. Uh, so many of the sources are in, at least the, the music sources are in French, um, which is helpful in that that's a language that I understand. Um, but uh, some of the sources from Senegal, for example, are in Wolof, which I, I understand some of. Um, so some of the challenges can de definitely be language barriers when I have sources in, uh, for example, Lingala. And uh, some of the Congolese music I used were was mostly in Lingala, which I do not speak. Uh, in that case, I worked with um, a Congolese scholar who was familiar with obviously the language, but then with the, the groups themselves, and he helped me translate uh, some of the, the songs, particularly those by uh, Loke Jazz, uh, one of the other Roomba bands that were active. Um, so language barriers are one major challenge. Another can be, as I mentioned before, finding the actual oral sources uh, in the first place. A lot of the songs uh, I had to go purchase myself um, or, you know, track old CDs of, uh, particularly with um, Awadi's music. I just a couple of them very easily on Amazon, but the rest you have to really look for. Um, and then likewise, I mean, to understand these oral sources, you can't just assume that what's being said uh, on the surface is the full meaning. You have to understand the context. You have to understand not just the historical context, but also the cultural context to some extent. Uh, so for example, once again, with um, a lot of the Congolese sources, I had to do a lot of reading um, by Johannes Fabien, anthropologist who works on the Congo, as well as talk to um, some Congolese scholars and colleagues that I had at uh, Miami about what do these sources exactly mean, you know, in terms of their cultural context, you know, what is the importance of this? Uh, one of the important things, um, I believe it was in uh, one of the, the Loke Jazz songs uh, where they talk about Lumumba and uh, there was no uh, burial place for Lumumba because he was he was uh, dismembered and dissolved in acid by the, the Belgians, uh, so there would be no physical memorial place. And uh, Franco in the song, he says, uh, you know, without the body, how can we cry? How can we mourn? And this points to uh, the practices of, you know, keeping the body uh, after someone's death for a few days, you know, washing the body, you know, having time to mourn prior to burial. With no body, there's no ability to mourn. So understanding the cultural context is also key to, um, you know, understanding the oral sources. I hope that answered the question, George. Yes, yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, I think we're going to say thank you so much, James, for sharing your research with us this morning. Thank you all for the wonderful questions, and I hope you all have a great day.